This happened to me on October 6, 2002, up in Washington State, Olympic Peninsula. Lived alone out there, and loved it. Most people, they visit the beaches on the coast, maybe hike to the waterfalls. Me? I headed deep into the rainforest, where the light barely reaches the ground, and the trees are old enough to tell you stories if you listen close. My name's Ezekiel, Zeke for short. See, I grew up with brothers. Brawny ones. They got into sports, I got into the woods. Figured if I learned to hunt, fish, survive out there, it'd even out our folks' attention a bit. It did. More than that, it became my thing. One crisp fall morning, I set out with my pack and rifle, heading deeper than usual. It wasn't about bagging deer, it was the feeling, the quiet that seeps into your bones. Found this creek, all mossy rocks and crystal clear water. Sat on a rock, unwrapping a sandwich, humming an old tune under my breath. That's when the forest went silent. The humming died on my lips. Birdsong, the buzzing of flies, even the rustle of leaves in the breeze, nothing. Then I smelled it. Wet fur, with a tang underneath like a bucket of rotten fish. I was on my feet, rifle up. My heart was pounding, not scared exactly, but something primal had switched on inside me. That sandwich sat half-eaten on the rock. Something moved up ahead, a flicker of darkness between the ancient trees. It was huge, moving on all fours, but not like any bear I've ever seen. Sleek, but too long in the body. And too high at the shoulder. My breath caught in my throat. A wolf on steroids? A deformed cougar? Then it raised its head towards my scent and my brain went blank. Its face, those eyes. I won't try to put it into words, not even now. Wrong is the closest I get. It charged. I barely had time to raise the rifle. Fired once, twice, but it was on me before I could reload. The force of the impact knocked me flying. I hit a tree trunk, hard. My vision went black for a second. When I could focus again, the creature was circling me. Fur matted, damp. Bullet holes seeped blood, but it seemed more enraged than hurt. Claws like obsidian knives raked the air inches from my face. I thrashed for the hunting knife on my belt barely got it free before the thing lunged again. I rolled, scrambled to my feet. My shoulders screamed in protest at the movement, but I ignored the pain. It came back at me, and the knife was all I had. I shouted, some nonsense word to fill the space where courage should have been. Our fight became a blur of motion. I felt the scrape of teeth on my forearm, the heat of its breath on my cheek. We were on the edge of the creek now. I swung blindly with the knife, and something tore loose. The creature howled. Not a wolf's howl, something deeper, more ragged. Stumbling backward, my boot hit the water. I slipped and went down hard, my arm throbbing. The beast paused, one paw half-submerged, water lapping at open wounds. It looked at me, and, I swear, something like hatred gleamed in those uncanny eyes. It crouched to spring, and I closed my eyes, waited for the killing blow. But it didn't come. After a moment, I dared to open a single eye. It was gone. Snarls and the sound of snapping branches echoed through the forest, fading as it retreated. I got to my feet, shaking and soaked to the bone. 
My arm throbbed, and blood ran in a steady trickle down my leg. The half-eaten sandwich still sat on the rock, a grim reminder of the peaceful morning that had shattered into something out of a nightmare. I made it back to civilization eventually. Got patched up at the hospital. They raised an eyebrow at the claw marks. I blamed a cougar. It was as close to the truth as anyone would believe, even myself. Now, I don't go deep into the woods anymore. Stick to trails sold the cabin, got myself a little apartment close to town. But I still hear that howl when I shut my eyes at night. Still see the shine of those eyes in every shadow and... Crash! The window shatters, spraying glass into the room. My breath hitches, my body tenses. In the gaping hole, framed by jagged shards of glass, I see them. Those eyes, glowing amber in the darkness. It knows where I am. It's found me. A scream tears from my throat, half fear, half a primal challenge. Outside, the creature hunches on the sill, its muscled form silhouetted against the night sky. The scent of blood and rot fills the room. There's nowhere to run. I scramble for the pistol I keep hidden, a foolish habit after years of uneventful city life. My fumbling fingers struggle with the lockbox. The creature lunges through the shattered window, a whirlwind of teeth and claws. Glass crunches beneath its weight as it lands. Adrenaline courses through me, replacing terror with a desperate flicker of fight. I fire the pistol, the thunderous reports deafening in the confined space. One shot, two, three, the beast snarls, stumbles, but keeps coming. Blood spatters the walls, but it seems unfazed. Out of bullets. I fling the empty pistol as a pathetic distraction, and it glances off the creature's shoulder. Then, I'm clawing for my hiking backpack, fumbling frantically inside. My fingers close around the bear spray. A last, desperate gamble. It lunges, jaws wide. I spray, aiming for the eyes. The creature roars, a sound of agony and fury. It thrashes, claws tearing at its ruined face. Momentary victory, then it focuses back on me, blinded but enraged beyond reason. I charge past, a blur of motion driven by sheer survival instinct. The creature barrels after me. I hear the crash of furniture overturned. My escape route is clear, the front door. I throw myself against it, wrenching it open. Stumbling out into the street, I slam the door behind me. For a precious second, I think I might have made it, then the wood splinters apart like paper. The creature bursts through, its roar echoing in the night. Neighbors' lights flicker on. Voices shout distantly, filled with confusion and rising fear. But they're too far away, too late. I run. The creature is an unstoppable force right behind me. My breath burns in my lungs, my legs give out. I collapse onto the asphalt, a strangled sob escaping me. The creature looms over me, a grotesque shadow against the street lights. I see my death reflected in those terrible eyes. Then, a blinding flash. Headlights. A car swerves wildly as the driver sees the scene unfolding. Tires squeal, the vehicle lurches to a stop, doors fly open. Shouts, a woman screaming my name. It all distorts into a haze as my vision starts to dim. The creature hesitates, taken aback by the sudden light and noise. Just enough time. Rough hands pull me up, 
half drag me towards the car. Pain explodes in my side as those terrible claws rake across my flesh. The car door slams shut. I slump against the seat, my body a screaming mass of agony. The engine roars as we speed away. I hear the creature's enraged bellow fading into the distance. The hospital. A blur of faces, questions that go unanswered, the persistent beeping of machines. Then, silence, blessed merciful silence as drugs dull the pain and drag me into darkness. When I wake, it's to the low murmur of voices outside my curtain cubicle. A police officer, a stony-faced woman in a suit claiming to be a wildlife investigator. They want my statement, the official version of events. A bear, I say, a rogue grizzly maybe. Anything but the truth. They exchange glances but don't press. I'm the sole survivor, my words all they have to go on. News reports follow. Wild animal attack. A freak occurrence. They theorize, drawing tidy conclusions the public desperately needs. Local hunters organize, promising swift justice for the victim. My apartment building is swarmed by reporters looking for a scoop hungry for the survivor's story. I slip away unnoticed. A new city, a fake name. No forwarding address. The nightmares persist, worse for the knowing they're not nightmares at all. Every rustle of leaves sends a jolt of terror down my spine. The shadows always seem to hold eyes. They say I'm lucky. I got away. But I know they're wrong. A part of me died back there in that shattered apartment, clawed into oblivion by something monstrous and real. And I know, deep down where the terror lives, that it hasn't forgotten. It knows I survived. It waits. And someday, somewhere, those eyes will find me again. This happened to me on July 17, 1982. Lived in a cabin tucked way back in the Ozarks. Figured a man could disappear out there, and if he wanted to be left alone, folks pretty much obliged. My name's Elias, Elias Barnes. Been a hunting guide most my life. Spend more time in the woods than in town. That summer was hot muggy kind of heat that makes you sweat just standing still. Not much tourism, and the few locals heading into the hills were keeping to the familiar trails me. I needed something different. Heard rumors, whispers about a ridge way to the south, almost never explored. Old timers talked about an abandoned mine up there, maybe a cave system. My curiosity outweighed my common sense as it often does. Took my old hound dog, Rusty, for company, and set off. Couple days of hard hiking, and the land started to change. Trees twisted, gnarled like something wasn't right with the soil. Less birdsong, the kind of quiet that makes your skin crawl. Even Rusty got skittish, whining and sniffing the air like he smelled something rotten. I should have turned back then. Should have, but I didn't. That afternoon, we came across the mine. Not much more than a gaping hole in the hillside, choked with vines and fallen rock. Something flickered in the shadows, just inside the entrance. An animal maybe? I knelt, peered into the darkness. It was too deep to see much but then a pair of eyes gleamed back at me. Yellow eyes, reflecting the sunlight like embers. They blinked and were gone. I grabbed Rusty's collar as he lunged forward, barking furiously at the empty blackness. Easy boy, 
I muttered. Something was seriously wrong with this whole place. But I couldn't shake the feeling, the itch under my skin telling me I was close to something, something new, something unknown. Night fell quickly in those thick woods. We made camp nearby. I kept a small fire going, more to ward off the creeping unease than the chill. Couldn't shake the image of those eyes. Around midnight, Rusty bolted awake, growling deep in his throat. I reached for my rifle just as a shape detached itself from the shadows at the edge of the firelight. It was massive. Towered head and shoulders over me, even hunched over on all fours. Its body was lean, sinewy, hairless. But the face, if that's what you want to call it, haunts me to this day. Like a man, but twisted all wrong, the jaw too long, the eyes too wide, filled with a sore of hungry intelligence. It hissed, a sound like steam escaping a rusty pipe. Rusty lunged, and the creature was on him. A blur of claws and teeth, a pained yelp, then, silence. I don't remember much after that. Just running, blindly, crashing through the undergrowth. Stumbling, falling, scrambling to my feet, the sounds of the creature close behind. Tripping over a root, my hands scraped raw on the rough ground. I turned, rifle raised. Two burning eyes in the darkness. Then it leapt. I fired, once, twice. The shots roared in the still night, but did they connect? I don't know. The creature, it faltered, stumbled. But it kept coming. And I ran. Through the night, through what felt like miles of twisting forest, I ran. The thing pursued me, keeping pace. I could hear its breathing, a ragged, wet sound, and sometimes a roar of frustration that echoed off the trees. Finally, just as the first streaks of dawn began to lighten the sky, I broke through the treeline. Burst out onto a dirt road, a familiar road. Civilization. My pickup truck was parked a mile or so away. I didn't stop running until I reached the truck, fumbled with the keys, threw myself inside. Slammed the door, threw it into gear, and sped away. I didn't look back until I reached the highway. When I glanced in the rearview mirror, the forest loomed dark and silent. The creature was gone. Made it home. Stumbled into my cabin, collapsed on the bed, still clutching the rifle. When I finally woke, it was dark again. Every slam of the wind against the house, every creak of the old timbers sounded like claws scrabbling at the door. I knew, even without looking, it would be out there. Just beyond the light, watching from the trees. And that's when the true terror hit me, if this thing was smart enough to track me, smart enough to toy with me, then it would follow me home. This cabin, my sanctuary, was now a trap. The days blurred together. I barricaded myself in the cabin, the windows boarded shut, the doors braced. Every night, I heard it out there, the scratching at the walls, the guttural growls, chilling echoes of some predatory hunger beyond my comprehension. Rusty's collar sat on the windowsill, the leather worn thin from years of use. I found myself talking to it sometimes, whispering apologies for his fate, for my own cowardice. The loneliness was its own sort of madness gnawing at my sanity. I barely slept. When I did, the nightmares were worse than reality, flashes of blood-spattered fur, the creature's relentless pursuit, and those eyes burning into my soul. The supplies wouldn't last forever. Desperation grew like a weed inside me. I knew I couldn't stay here. 
but going outside meant facing my tormentor, a death sentence more certain than starving within these walls. One night, it came up with a new tactic. I heard it mimicking Rusty's bark. Then, a pathetic whine, like a wounded animal. My heart pounded, a mix of fear and desperate, foolish hope. Had Rusty somehow survived? I knew I was being played, but the isolation, it had worn me down. I cracked open the window, rifle raised. In the pale moonlight filtering through the trees, I saw nothing at first. Just the shadows playing tricks, feeding my desperation. Then it moved. A dark shape detaching itself from the base of a tree. It limped forward, dragging one leg, whimpering softly. Even in the dim light, I saw the ragged wounds, the missing patches of fur. But, those eyes. Unchanged. Glowing with that same calculated hunger. I hesitated. The part of me still capable of reason screamed at me to slam the window shut, to turn away. Yet, there was a shred of guilt, the desperate wish to believe this could somehow be real. Maybe I'd injured it enough that it was, retreating? The rifle wavered in my hands, Rusty's whimper echoing in my ears. And that's when it lunged. Impossible speed, its ragged form propelled forward. In a single fluid motion, the creature smashed through the window spraying shards of glass. I fired. The blast echoed in the small room, and the creature screamed. Thick blood spattered across the walls, painting them in a grotesque tableau. But even injured, rage twisted its features into an unholy mask. I fired again, point-blank, and something tore loose with a wet ripping sound. The creature staggered backward, a low choking sound escaping its ruined throat. Still, it advanced, dragging itself towards me like some relentless horror movie monster. I fumbled for another shell, but there was nothing left. Resignation washed over me. I tossed the useless rifle aside, raising my hands in a pathetic gesture of surrender. My death would be quick at least. Better than being torn apart piece by piece. But the creature stopped. It slumped against the far wall, ragged breaths fading. The yellow eyes fixed on me, and in them, I saw a glimmer not just of hate, but of satisfaction. Then, with a final shudder, it went still. The authorities found me two days later. Hold up in the ruins of my cabin, babbling nonsense about monsters and glowing eyes. They didn't find a body, just the trails of blood, some strange and human footprints leading away from the cabin and disappearing into the woods. I ended up institutionalized. They call it trauma-induced psychosis. It's a tidy diagnosis, a way to dismiss what can't be explained. The staff changes, but I remain a fixture. In the quiet hours, I sometimes catch a whiff of wet fur and something foul underneath, clinging to my clothes. And some nights, very late, when the wind howls around the stone walls of the hospital, a part of me believes that it might be calling for me. That it's not dead. Not really. Every so often, a new hiker vanishes in the Ozarks. Search parties scour the hills, come back empty-handed. Old-timers in the nearby towns shake their heads, mutter about that ridge best left alone, about the evil things lurking in the deep woods. In my padded cell, when my mind begins to race down those dark corridors again, I touch the scar on my arm a jagged testament to the day I encountered true darkness. The doctors don't believe a word I say, but the scar. The scar remains. 
and deep down, the worst part of me knows. Out there, somewhere in those shadowed forests, my unfinished business still waits. This happened to me on February 22, 1996. I was living out in the Colorado Rockies, a little off-grid cabin a buddy and I had rehabbed a couple years back. Most folks think of those mountains as touristy, but we were way out on the western slope, where towns are few and far between. Figured after my divorce, some quiet wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Name's Caleb. I used to hunt a bit, mostly deer and elk. Kept my skills sharp, and the freezer full. That afternoon I set out for an easy hike, just me and the dog, Gus. He was a big old mutt, a rescue, figured having him around would be good security out in the sticks. It was that weird in-between weather, winter holding on but hinting at spring. We were following a deer trail up a ridge, going higher than usual. The higher we got, the less Gus seemed to like it. He kept whimpering, looking back over his shoulder. I figured he was just being his usual nervous self. Then we reached the crest, and I saw it. Not the view, I mean. Something was wrong with a clump of trees up ahead. Bark stripped, branches torn up, almost like something huge had ripped through them in a fit of rage. Something, big. My heart starts to pound, but logic kicks in, bear country, most likely. Bear with a bad temper getting ready to hibernate maybe. I put myself between Gus and the damage, raised my rifle, more as a warning than anything else. I stepped closer, calling out to warn the bear off. Gus was practically hiding behind my legs now. That's when I saw the blood. Not much, just a few spatters on the snow. And, fur. Black fur, coarse and long. Stuck to a branch, caught on the rough bark. My mind raced. That fur wasn't bear fur. I moved closer, wary now. Something was wrong. Then I saw them, footprints. Massive things, sunk deep into the melting snow, not paws, almost, human-like, if a human was a giant. Suddenly, Gus bolted. Took off into the trees, barking frantically. Stupid dog, what was he thinking? I cursed under my breath, then followed. I couldn't leave him out there alone. We ran deeper into the woods, the prince leading us onward. The light started to fail, long shadows stretching across the forest floor. Gus had stopped barking, replaced by a low whine. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. Then, we stumbled into a clearing. And it was there. I froze. Gus whimpered and tucked himself against my leg. The thing was immense, standing on two legs easily ten feet tall. Sleek, but too long in the torso, the limbs too powerful to be human. The face, those eyes. They stared back at me, burning with a chilling intelligence, filled with a sort of hunger. It roared, a sound that shook the trees around us. My ears rang, my hands slick with sweat on the rifle. I aimed and I fired, the sound echoing through the dusk. The creature stumbled, a howl piercing the air. I saw blood but it kept coming. I fired again, and again. It staggered, but with every shot, it seemed to get angrier, more determined. Gus yelped, wrenched himself free, and ran. I yelled for him to come back, but my voice cracked, barely audible over the creature's rage-filled roars. Then, 
the unthinkable happened. The creature changed focus, lunging not towards me, but towards the fleeing dog. I watched in horror as it closed the distance in a few monstrous strides. Gus never stood a chance. A flash of movement, a terrible yelp cut short, and then, silence. Just the ragged breathing of the beast as it turned back to me, its muzzle slick with crimson. And the worst part, the worst part was the look, almost satisfied. I ran. I don't remember much of the escape. Just the sound of my own ragged breaths, the pounding of my heart, and the certainty I was going to die in these woods. The creature was toying with me, I realized. Keeping pace, letting me think I had a chance. By the time I burst from the woods onto the dirt track leading back to my cabin, it was nightfall. The creature didn't follow me into the open. Just a silhouette against the horizon, unmoving. I slammed the cabin door shut, fumbling for the locks. Slumping to the floor, every muscle trembling, I realized the truth. This wasn't a bear, not an animal I understood. It was watching. Waiting. And. A low, scratching sound makes me freeze. It's at the window. It knows where I am. It's going to take its time. The scratching gets louder, more frantic. Each ragged sound sends a jolt of terror through me. I drag myself to my feet, grab the shotgun that leans by the back door. It's loaded with buckshot, my best hope against that thing outside. The wood around the window splinters. A massive clawed hand forces its way inside, groping in the darkness. I fire. The blast echoes in the small room, the smell of gunpowder acrid in the air. The hand flinches back. I hear a roar of pain, then an enraged thrashing against the cabin walls. Time loses all meaning. Every creak, every thud fills me with dread. I reload, hands shaking, and aim the shotgun at the door, knowing it's a futile gesture. Those old cabin walls won't hold long against something like that. There's a plan forming in my head, a desperate, reckless one. I grab my backpack, matches, a flashlight, the few supplies I'd kept stashed for emergencies. Then, the kerosene lantern. The one I keep full for nights when the old generator fails. Another crash. The back door hinges scream in protest. I move towards it not away. With a trembling hand, I strike a match and light the lantern's wick. The creature bursts through the ruined doorway. A grotesque parody of a man, dripping blood, a mangled hand dangling uselessly. For a heart-stopping moment, we freeze, predator and prey, locked in a final desperate standoff. I toss the lantern, it shatters against the beast's chest, kerosene splashing, flames crackling to life instantly. The scream it lets out is an animal, isn't human. It's something far worse, a mix of fury and agony. The creature becomes a raging inferno, a pillar of fire in the small space of the cabin. I dive past, out into the night. I don't look back until I reach the edge of the clearing. The cabin is fully ablaze now. The flames lick at the night sky, the heat intense even from a distance. Within that burning pyre, the creature thrashes, its screams echoing gruesomely in the darkness. Then, silence. The flames begin to die down, leaving a smoking, smoldering ruin. My home, my safe haven, gone. And with it, perhaps, the monstrosity that stalked me.
dawn paints the sky in bleak colors. My legs give out, and I collapse on the cold ground, my body finally accepting the exhaustion it had fought for so long. There's nothing left to run from, and nowhere left to run to. When help arrives, it's slow and disbelieving. Forest rangers, brought in by the smoke plume, find me at the scene. My story, well, let's just say it lands me in a different kind of confinement. Hospital Psych Ward They spin the official tale, fire started by a faulty lantern, man traumatized by the ordeal, imagining the rest. They say I couldn't have survived a bear attack, certainly not a fight with one. No sign of Gus is ever found. I don't fight them. Part of me believes they might be right. Did I hallucinate, driven mad by the isolation, by the echoes of my own fear? But then there are the nights when I wake screaming, the smell of burning fur and something far fouler heavy in the air. The nights when I see those burning eyes in the darkness, filled not just with rage this time, but a chilling promise. News filters into the ward. Hunters disappearing in the same stretch of mountains. Campers found torn apart. Whispers of something unnatural, something the locals can't explain. The rangers start patrolling in pairs, armed with heavier weaponry than normal. I say nothing. Let them think it's a rogue grizzly, a freak occurrence. Let them feel secure in their explanations. Because I know the truth. I know that somewhere out there, in the vast untamed wilderness of the Rockies, it roams. Maybe it's injured, maybe dying from the burns. And maybe, just maybe, it leaves me alone, believing its revenge was taken on that fiery night. But deep down, in the part of me that still clings to sanity by a fraying thread, I know better. Wounded creatures are the most dangerous. And this creature, this, thing. It waits. It heals. And someday, those burning eyes will find me again. This happened to me on October 23, 2012, somewhere deep in the Idaho backcountry took a job up there with the Forest Service, marking trees for logging. Got myself a little cabin just off a dirt road, miles from civilization. Figured some time alone after the divorce was just what I needed. My name's Rick. Bad idea. Real bad. Should've left right away. Should have listened to those gut feelings that prickled the back of my neck the first time I heard those howls echoing through the trees at night. Too thick, too deep for a wolf. Too filled with a dark, hungry cunning for a coyote. Figured it was my imagination on overdrive. Then, a deer carcass showed up near my cabin. Not a clean kill. More like, torn apart bones shattered, the way a grizzly might do it. But no grizzly tracks. Just those huge, clawed things I kept seeing pressed into the mud. Whatever was out there, it was big, powerful, and smart enough to avoid leaving clear evidence. Started getting glimpses of it, too. Bursts of black fur between the trees glowing yellow eyes reflecting the beam of my flashlight. Found myself sleeping with my axe next to the bed. Never even locked my doors before moving up here, now I was piling furniture against them every night. Figured I was on the verge of a full-blown breakdown. Tried telling myself it was just an animal, defending its territory. Until the night I heard the screaming. Woke me from a dead sleep. High-pitched, terrified, echoing through the forest. Human, I'd swear it. 
cut off abruptly. The silence after was even worse. Next morning, followed the sound as best I could. Found blood on the leaves, a shredded backpack hanging from a low branch. No body. Got the hell out of there then. Drove straight to the nearest ranger station, told them everything, the carcass, the howls, the eyes in the dark, and the screaming. That old ranger, Hank, he just looked at me sadly. Told me I wasn't the first to come stumbling in with stories like that. Said there were things out there that the guidebooks don't warn about. Reckoned whoever it was that screamed had gotten added to the long list of missing persons folks just chalked up to animal attacks or wilderness accidents. He gave me some supplies, pointed me towards the nearest highway, and told me to forget what I'd seen. Figured I would, try to pass it off as my mind playing tricks after too much isolation. But deep down, I know that wasn't the case. Out there, lurking in the shadows, something monstrous was real, and getting bolder. Sold everything I owned and got an apartment in the city. I locked the door obsessively now, triple checking it every night. Can't stand being near large stretches of wilderness, get an itchy feeling in my bones if a park stretches for more than a few blocks. They tell me I have PTSD, that I need therapy. Maybe they're right. But even here, surrounded by concrete and cars, I hear those howls in my nightmares. Sometimes, when the wind howls around the building in just the right way, I swear I smell that wet fur musk hanging thick in the air. And the worst part, the thing that keeps me awake staring at the dark ceiling? A few weeks back, there was a report in the news. Hiker gone missing from a national park, just a few hours' drive from my old stomping grounds. Park rangers found his campsite torn apart. The newscaster, she said something about unusual signs of animal activity at the scene. I know better. They may never find his body, just like they never found the others. But I know what's out there. What's thriving in the forests just beyond the suburb's sprawl. And every single night, I lie awake and listen for the scratching at the window, those glowing eyes peering in. Years passed. Tried to become one of those faceless city dwellers, blend into the crowd, disappear. Didn't work. The paranoia lingered, burrowing into my every thought. Every shadow seemed to stretch a little too long, every rustle behind me made my heart jump. Tried drinking to forget, but the nightmares always broke through. Finally, couldn't take it anymore. Packed my bags, left the city, my job, my whole damn life behind. Bought a small piece of land out in the desert. Far from any forests figured a creature of the shadows wouldn't follow me out into the harsh, open sun. Built myself a cabin, low-slung, concrete, all sharp angles and straight lines. No dark corners to hide in. Floodlights rigged up all around the perimeter, motion detectors, cameras feeding footage directly to the hard drive in my bedroom. If that thing things, tried to get close, I'd be ready. Slept with a loaded shotgun under the bed, pistol within easy reach of the pillow. Became a recluse, a desert hermit, the crazy guy with the fortress mentality. The isolation was better than the fear, at least for a while. Then the dogs started disappearing. Rancher's pets, strays that wandered too close to the scrubland bordering my property. At first, I figured coyotes. Then I saw the tracks around one half-eaten carcass, too big, the claws too damn long. My blood ran cold. It took years, but it had found me. 
doubled down on the defenses. Got myself two huge Dobermans, trained them for attack. Built a high perimeter fence around the property, barbed wire top and bottom. Never went outside at night. But I could feel it out there, circling just beyond the floodlights, a malevolent hunger in the darkness. The tension was unbearable. Waiting for the attack, not knowing when or how it would come. Knew in my gut, though, that this time wouldn't be just snatch and run. This time, it was personal. One night, the dogs went berserk. Barking, snarling, throwing themselves at the fence. I scrambled out of bed, shotgun in hand, heart pounding. Floodlights blazed on, scanning the emptiness. Nothing. Just the wind whipping sand across the desolate landscape. But the dogs wouldn't calm down, staring into the darkness, hackles raised. Finally, I saw it, a flicker of movement at the edge of the light. Just a glimpse, then it was gone. But that glimpse was enough. Not one creature this time, but three. The massive, hulking leader, its eyes blazing. The smaller one, still huge, but with lighter fur. And then, my blood froze, a third shape slinking between them, smaller yet, gangly limbs too long, but that same monstrous wolfish head tilting with chilling curiosity. A cub. That's when I knew I couldn't win. A mother, protecting her young, driven by an instinct older and fiercer than anything mankind could muster, it was hopeless. It was only a matter of time until they found a way past my defenses. The locals found me two days later, or what was left of me. Cabin was torn apart, the concrete walls clawed open like they were cardboard. Cameras were smashed, footage corrupted. The Dobermans, God, I won't even describe what they did to them. News said it was the worst animal attack they'd ever seen. Ripped the story straight from the headlines, rogue bear, maybe even a whole pack of feral wolves, driven mad with hunger, gone completely off the rails. They test the soil for rabies, analyze the scat, try to fit the pieces into a rational pattern. But I knew the truth. This wasn't about rabies, or hunger, or even territory. This was a vendetta, a reckoning, monstrous and implacable as the desert itself. They hunted me, from the shadowed forests into the sun-blasted scrub, never giving up, evolving their strategy. Out there, in the vast uncharted wildness, they learned patience. I built my fort, they laid siege. They say there's no evidence to suggest anything other than an animal attack. But sometimes, late at night, I think I hear a whimpering on the wind. A mewling, childlike cry carried across the barren miles. And I know, out there under the wide desert sky, the family thrives. The next generation grows, learns the old ways, inherits the blood feud. I was just the first on their list, not the last. For all my concrete and floodlights and firepower, all it did was teach those uncanny predators how to adapt, how to play the long game. Hunters, they become the hunted. Hikers, campers, anyone foolish enough to think themselves safe out in the wilderness, they're all targets now. It's an open season that never ends and the monsters have learned how to stalk unseen beneath the cloak of the normal, the explainable. Maybe someday, some smart biologist looking at the statistics of unsolved disappearances will notice the pattern, realize there's a new apex predator in play, a shadow species operating right under our noses. But by then, it'll be far too late.
This happened to me on October 12, 2008. Moved up to Maine, way out in the boonies, looking for solitude. Ex-military, saw plenty of action, thought my nerves were past rattling. Turns out, nothing prepares you for the quiet that deep in the woods. My name's Wyatt. Small cabin, just me and my dog, old lab named Tank. Hunted, fished, kept to myself, exactly how I liked it. Folks figure living like that makes you a weirdo, but cities, that's where the true monsters dwell. One crisp autumn morning, Tank and I headed up a hiking trail less folks used. Something about the air that day felt off, too still, the birdsong gone quiet. Tried shrugging it off, but Tank was on edge, hackles raised, growling at shadows. Figured it was a bear, nothing unusual there. The trail wound deeper into the woods. We came across a deer carcass. Not scavenged, but not a clean kill either. Torn up, chunks of flesh ripped out haphazardly. That's when I saw the tracks. Big, but not bare big, and something about the shape was wrong. Something clicked on high alert in the back of my mind. Told Tank to heal, kept my hand close to the hunting knife on my belt. Figured we'd double back, no point in tempting whatever made those tracks started back, but Tank whined, then took off down the trail, barking ferociously. That dog was loyal to a fault. I swore under my breath and took off at a run, following the barks. Found him at a clearing, barking at, nothing. He circled, sniffing the air, confused. Then he let out a yelp and bolted into the trees. I skidded to a halt at the edge of the clearing, rifle coming up. My heart was pounding like a war drum. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw it, a flicker of movement, too fast to be natural. Tank's barks echoed through the woods, fading into the distance. And that's when it hit me. That silence. Even the insects had gone quiet. The forest held its breath. I scanned the tree lean, every nerve on fire. Then it stepped into the clearing. It stood easily eight feet tall, lean, but with corded muscles bulging beneath sleek, dark fur. Powerful legs, but ending in clawed hands instead of paws, too long to be right. The head... That's what nightmares are made of. Like a twisted wolf, the muzzle stretched out too far, filled with teeth meant for tearing. And the eyes, yellow, burning with a malevolent light. We locked eyes across that clearing. And even with my rifle in hand, a wave of primal terror crashed over me. This was an animal. Wasn't anything I understood. It tilted its head, almost curious, then dropped to all fours. That's when it charged. I fired, once, twice. The sound was deafening in the sudden hush of the forest. My shots didn't stop it, but they made it hesitate. Blood spattered the fallen leaves, staining them crimson. It roared, a monstrous inhuman sound, and kept coming. Blind panic almost had me dropping the rifle and fleeing, but years of training kicked in. I ejected the spent shells, fumbling for fresh rounds. Loaded with shaking hands just as the creature reached me. Tank burst out of the undergrowth, a black and tan streak of teeth and fur. He launched himself at the creature, a desperate distraction. It snarled batting him aside like he was nothing. I heard a terrible yelp, then Tank's body slammed into a tree trunk. He didn't get up. Pure rage surged through me, the world fading to red. I aimed and fired, 
fired again, screaming incoherently as I emptied the rifle, pumping round after round into the creature. It howled, staggered, fell to its knees, and still, somehow, it raised its head. Those hateful eyes burned even brighter, locked on mine. A single, choke sob tore out of me. I knew, with bone-deep certainty, that this wasn't over. I fumbled for my knife, knowing how futile it was, as the creature began to drag itself towards me. The creature's movements were jagged, fueled by relentless fury. Blood poured from fresh wounds, steaming in the cold air, the stench of it making my stomach churn. It left a crimson trail across the forest floor, inching closer with every ragged breath. My legs wouldn't move. It was useless, I knew that, but some primal part of me refused to give up. I watched, mesmerized by the grotesque determination in those dying eyes. This struggle, this fight for survival had become a perverse dance, a duel neither of us could win. Then, a noise pierced the heavy silence. Tires crunching on gravel, voices, human voices approaching. For a heart-stopping moment, hope flickered to life within me. Salvation had arrived. The creature heard it too. It raised its mangled head, snarling in frustration. Then, impossibly, it began to melt into the shadows, slinking away on broken limbs. Over there! A man's shout, rough and unfamiliar. A hunting party must have heard the gunshots. I opened my mouth to call out, but found I'd lost my voice. Instead, I waved a weak hand in the direction of the disappearing shadow. They came running, two burly men with rifles, a woman with a grim-set jaw. Their flashlights cut through the twilight, landing first on tanks still form, then moving towards me. Christ Almighty, one of the men muttered as they took in the scene. The clearing was a mess, leaves trampled and spattered with blood, trees scarred with claw marks, the lingering scent of something sulfurous and feral. I found my voice then, cracked and faint. It went, that way, was all I could manage. They exchanged glances, doubt clear on their faces. Then the woman knelt beside Tank, checking for a pulse. She shook her head, compassion warring with a hunter's practicality on her face. We'll track it, she said. But first, let's get you out of here. The world began to tilt and swirl. The events of the past hour finally crashed over me. They half carried me back towards their truck, my feet stumbling, useless. I babbled apologies for Tank and I think someone asked my name and if I was hurt, but I barely heard them. All I could see were those burning yellow eyes. They didn't find the creature. Maybe it died from its wounds, dragged itself off to a forgotten corner of those vast woods to rot. Maybe not. It took days for me to speak coherently again. The local sheriff listened to my story, a skeptical frown on his weathered face. The other hunters backed me up, to a point. No, they hadn't seen the creature. Yes, the carcass in Tank's body had looked, odd. Accident report chalked it up to an unlikely bear attack. The papers ran a small column, Hunter loses dog, survives encounter with wild animal. It became one of those half-believed local legends whispered over campfires. The nightmares didn't stop. I'd wake up screaming, drenched in sweat, the taste of iron in my mouth and the image of those hate-filled eyes seared into my brain. Couldn't shake the feeling, the knowledge, that something monstrous still lurked in the heart of those woods. Folks started avoiding me. 
Whispers followed me around town, Crazy Wyatt, the man who'd lost his mind along with his dog. They didn't see the way I flinched at shadows, the rifle I kept loaded beside my bed. They didn't understand that I wasn't crazy at all. I was cursed with knowing the truth. That cabin in the woods, my supposed sanctuary, became a prison. Every rustle outside sent my heart pounding. Every creak of the floorboards made me jump for a weapon. I left, of course. Sold the place for a pittance, disappeared into the anonymity of the city. But some nights, when the fog rolls in thick enough to obscure the streetlights, I hear a scratching at my apartment window. And I swear, in the flickering darkness between the buildings, I see flashes of yellow fire. Those in the forests claim they hear a strange cry sometimes, echoing on moonless nights. A mournful howl filled with rage, an endless promise of bloody vengeance. I know it's out there. Maybe injured, maybe weaker, maybe even dying. But knowing that doesn't bring me any comfort. Because a part of me believes that it might be healing. It might be learning from the encounter, adapting, becoming even deadlier. And as long as it exists, I'll never truly sleep soundly again. It bides its time, a hunter scarred but unbowed. And deep down, I know it's only a matter of time before our paths cross once more. The only question is, when that day comes, will I be the hunter, or the prey? This happened to me on September 18, 2001 out in the woods near Mount Rainier, Washington State. Folks thought I was crazy moving into a cabin out there after, after everything. But I needed space, to be alone after losing Sarah. My name's Caleb. I used to hunt a lot, deer, elk, mostly. Figured living out in the backcountry, I'd need those skills kept my rifle clean and practiced at a little makeshift range I'd set up in a clearing. Guess part of me figured being armed would make me feel safer. Didn't then, certainly doesn't now. One late afternoon, I was out gathering firewood. Autumn chill was in the air, leaves turning. The woods felt different that day, too quiet. Even the birds had stopped singing. Then I saw them, tracks, way too big for a bear or cougar. Deep, in an odd, clawed shape. Figured it must be a hoax, teen pranksters messing with my head. Told myself that until the sun began to set and the trees cast long shadows. I swear I could feel something watching me from the deepening gloom. Headed back to the cabin, faster than I'd like to admit. Didn't sleep a wink that night. Next morning, armed with the rifle and more courage than sense, I followed the tracks led deeper into the woods, towards a part of the mountain less folks went. Started finding signs of something. Ripped up tree trunks, first snagged on branches, dark and coarse and a smell, rotting and foul, hanging in the air. That's when I saw it. Standing in a sun-dappled clearing, it's back to me. Massive, a towering figure covered in dark matted fur, the head, the head was what nightmares are made of. Like a wolf, but monstrously distorted, the snout long and dripping. It began to turn, and I saw those eyes blazing yellow with bottomless hunger. I froze. Not in fear, something else. A jolt of recognition, a buried memory trying to claw its way to the surface. Then it charged. I snapped out of it, raised the rifle and fired. The creature roared, a bone-chilling sound that sent shivers down my spine. 
blood splattered the fallen leaves, and for a heart-stopping second, I thought I'd struck a fatal blow. But it kept coming. I fired again and again, the smell of gunpowder mingling with the stench of the beast. Finally, with a howl that echoed through the hills, the creature staggered. Fell to its knees, head drooping. Those monstrous eyes locked on mine, burning with hatred even in death. I think I passed out. Don't rightly remember. When I came to, it was dusk. The body was gone. No drag marks, no trail. Just a few patches of blood, soaked into the leaves, to prove I hadn't imagined the whole thing. I stumbled back to the cabin, rifle dangling uselessly from my hand. Something shifted that day, both in the woods and inside me. The locals think I'm losing it, whispering about another hiker found ripped to shreds nearby. They blamed it on a rogue cougar, but I know better. Now, every time the wind moans through the trees, every time a branch snaps in the night, I taste iron in my mouth and the image of those eyes flashes back into my mind. Because I didn't just kill something that day in the woods, I awoke something far older, far darker. It knows where I live. It knows I'm alone. And the worst part? This strange twisted sense of deja vu, a memory from another life, another time, prickles the back of my neck. Another confrontation, bloody and brutal, echoes through my dreams. Another ending I didn't survive. That haunted feeling, it didn't get better. Each day, the certainty grew that I wasn't being hunted, wasn't being stalked. This was something else. Like a game, an echo of a past conflict, destined to play out again. Nights became unbearable. I'd bury the windows, bolt the doors, my rifle loaded beside my bed. Every rustle outside, every creak of the old cabin made me jump. But still the nightmares came, even when I managed to snatch a few hours of fitful sleep. The hulking figure, the yellow eyes, and always, the same bloody end, my bloody end. The days weren't much better. I spent them fortifying the cabin. Traps around the perimeter, the ones meant for big game. I knew, deep down, they wouldn't make much difference. This wasn't a flesh and blood predator I was dealing with. One afternoon, I was chopping firewood, trying to exhaust myself so maybe, just maybe, I could sleep without seeing those damned eyes in my dreams. Heard a growl, a low rumble that sent a chill straight to my bones. Snapped my head up. It was there, standing a few yards away, just beyond the tree lean. Watching me. Its form was almost human, but twisted grotesquely, too tall, too lean. The face, that muzzle, those teeth, a parody of a wolf trapped in a permanent snarl. And the eyes, burning like hellfire. I dropped the axe, scrambled backwards toward the cabin. My legs felt like water. All those weeks of preparation, the traps, the rifle, none of it mattered now it was here. I fumbled with the doorknob, my breath coming in ragged gasps. It didn't rush, didn't charge. Just ambled towards me, each movement both horribly familiar and utterly alien. I burst through the door, slammed it shut, locked it with trembling hands. I knew it was futile. Wood would never hold against something like that. Leaned against the door jam, panting. Where was my rifle? Dropped it somewhere in the panic? And then it began. The pounding on the door. Not frantic, not like an animal, but slow and deliberate, 
each thud shaking the flimsy cabin and making my teeth rattle. It would get through, that wasn't a question, just a matter of time. In desperation, I started barricading the door, the table, chairs, anything heavy I could move. Even as I did, I knew it was pointless. Despair wrapped around me like a shroud. A heavy thud made the walls shake violently. A section of the door splintered inward, showering me with bits of wood. Then again. And again. Each pulverizing blow brought it closer, closer to me, closer to the ending I'd seen countless times in my nightmares. I scrambled to the window, heart thundering. It was a long drop to the ground, but maybe, maybe if I could reach the woods, hide, perhaps it would lose interest. Blindly, I wrenched the window open and hoisted myself onto the sill. And then, they were there. Its eyes. Glowing in the semi-darkness of the room. It didn't move to stop me. It was, savoring the moment, drawing out the inevitable. A low snarl echoed in the room, a sound of pure, malevolent satisfaction. With a choked sob, I retreated from the window, stumbled backward. There was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Only the thing in the gloom, the tattered remains of the door groaning under its methodical assault, and the echo of those nightmarish visions of my own violent demise. They found my cabin a few days later. Called it another animal attack. Claimed the place was a mess, furniture overturned, walls ripped up, like a wild struggle had taken place. But of me, of the creature, nothing. Just a few drops of blood on the floorboards. Folks in town, they whisper even more now. Crazy Caleb, the guy who lost his wife in that freak accident and then disappeared into the woods, well, he got what he deserved. Some say they hear my screams late at night, echoing off the mountains. That they sometimes see a dark, lumbering shape, moving at the edge of the tree lean. They're half right. They hear the echoes of my dying screams, my terror, as they replay endlessly. But what they see, what stalks those woods, it isn't me. Or at least, not anymore. The creature, whatever it is, it didn't merely kill me. It consumed me. My mind, my memories, my very being. We're intertwined now bound together in this twisted cycle of violence. Some nights, I can still feel a flicker of my old self, trapped behind those monstrous eyes, a silent witness to its bloody hunts, the terror of its victims. Other nights, I am the burning eyes, the predator, filled with a hunger that can never be sated. And the worst part, the part that chills me to the very core of what's left of my soul, Somewhere, buried under layers of nightmare and instinct, is the perverse knowledge that, one distant lifetime ago, this was a role I chose. This happened to me on June 19, 1997, way back in the Cascade Mountains. Ex-military, looking for peace and quiet got hired on as a caretaker at an old hunting lodge up there, a place so remote it was only reachable by a rough dirt road for a few weeks a year. Figured it'd be perfect. My name's Wyatt. Those first months were exactly the escape I craved. Hiking, fishing, maintaining the lodge, just me in the vast wilderness. But come winter, when the snows caught me off from the outside world completely, things shifted. Started with that feeling you get, the prickle at the back of your neck that says you aren't alone. Heavy footsteps circling the lodge at night, but when I'd go out, guns in hand, 
flashlight blazing, always nothing out there. Then things started disappearing. Tools, supplies, small game I'd trapped. Chalked it up to my own carelessness at first. Then one morning, I found tracks huge tracks, with long claws, bigger than any damn bear I'd ever seen. Right outside my cabin door. That's when the dread settled into my bones. Whatever was out there was big, smart, and getting bolder. Started leaving meat scraps at the edge of the woods, hoping to placate it. The food would disappear, but the tracks kept coming closer. Should have left then. Packed up while I still had a chance. But that stubborn streak kicked in, the I ain't afraid of no damn monster, bravado. Built heavier barricades, stocked up on ammo, turned the lodge into a fortress. Figured I'd see this through, come hell or high water. One night, it came. Blizzard was raging, the wind screaming like a banshee. I was hunkered down, shotgun in my lap, staring out the narrow window into the swirling snow. That's when I saw them. Two glowing yellow eyes, piercing through the storm, reflecting the firelight. It was massive, easily taller than me even on all fours. Covered in coarse, dark fur that seemed to ripple in the shadows. The head, nightmare fuel. Wolf-like, but stretched and distorted, filled with a chilling intelligence. Terror made me freeze. It took a step closer, then another, its muzzle twitching as it scented the air. I could see its breath steaming in the frigid wind, the long, curved fangs glistening in the firelight. Then, it let out a low growl, the sound vibrating through the walls of the cabin. Then more shapes formed out of the swirling storm. The leader, massive and malevolent. Another, slightly smaller, female. And behind them, a cub. Still huge, bigger than most grown dogs, but with those unmistakable, gangly limbs and the same monstrous head shape. A family. I fumbled for the shotgun, raised it, finger trembling on the trigger. But even through my fear haze, I hesitated. Those eyes, burning in the darkness, there was more than hunger there. These weren't just predators, they were defending something. Their territory, their offspring, maybe even a twisted concept of revenge for the things I had trapped and eaten to survive. In that frozen moment, trapped between the raging storm outside and the monstrous family on the brink of attack, something shifted in me. I wasn't an ex-soldier staring down the enemy anymore, not a hunter matching wits with his quarry. I was just a terrified man, monstrously outmatched. Slowly, I lowered the shotgun. The lead creature tilted its head, let out a questioning snort. I edged back from the window, trying to convey that I meant no harm. Its eyes narrowed, but it didn't charge. Then, as if on some unseen signal, the family turned and vanished back into the blizzard. The blizzard raged for days. I huddled inside the cabin, barely sleeping, haunted by the image of those eyes gleaming in the storm. When the snow finally let up, I ventured outside. No sign of the creatures, but my offerings remained untouched. A fragile truce had settled over the clearing. I stayed inside, they stayed in the forest. I'd leave food out occasionally, a peace offering, and they wouldn't come too close to the lodge. It wasn't sustainable, this tense coexistence between man and monster, but it was, something. Then spring came. With the thaw, the dirt road back to civilization became passable again. I wrestled with the decision. On the one hand, I could break the siege, 
return to the world, try to forget this whole chilling ordeal. On the other, guilt gnawed at me. If I left, what would happen to them? They'd grown, in some strange way, reliant on my presence. Foolishly, I stayed. Resupplied at the nearest town, told folks the winter had been rough, but I was pulling through. Figured I'd spend another season up there, see how things went, maybe try to understand these creatures better. Bad call. I got complacent. That's the real danger, out in the wilderness. You start to feel safe, routine lulls you into a false sense of security. One morning, heading out to the woodshed, I made that fatal mistake. Didn't bother with the shotgun, just the axe for splitting wood. They came out of nowhere. One moment, the birds were singing, the next, a blur of dark fur and fangs. The female knocked me off my feet, my axe flying from my grasp. Pain exploded in my shoulder as she bit down, the sheer force threatening to snap bone. I screamed, scrambled back, trying to fend her off. Then the leader lunged, not to kill, but to grapple. It pinned me to the ground, its weight crushing. The world narrowed down to its fetid breath in my face, those yellow eyes filled with terrible triumph. That's when I heard the worst sound of all, a high-pitched yelp. The cub, watching, learning. Desperation fueled a final surge of adrenaline. I thrashed, managed to get a hand free, fumbled in my pocket for the folding knife I always carried. Flicked it open, plunged it into the thick fur of the creature crushing me, slashing with blind, panicked abandon. It roared, not in pain, but in startled rage. Leaped back, giving me space. The female, snapping and snarling, circled warily. My shoulder throbbed, blood soaking through my shirt. Dizzy, the world tilting, I managed to stagger upright, to find my axe. They didn't attack again. Just watched, the leader breathing heavily, a trickle of blood dripping from its flank. Then, as slowly as they'd appeared, they retreated into the shadows of the trees. The cub, whimpering, followed last. Got myself patched up in town, lied about a bear attack. My shoulder healed, but not properly, serves as a constant, aching reminder. Sold the lodge, left the mountains, tried to disappear back into the anonymity of the city. But the nightmares followed me. Those burning eyes in the darkness, filled not just with hunger, but with a cold hatred unlike anything I faced in combat. It wasn't the physical scars I couldn't escape, though those were real enough. It was the knowledge, the bone-deep certainty, that what happened up there wasn't an isolated incident. It was the start of something. That family, lurking in the wild places, they'd learned. They'd evolved. And the chilling thing was, I'd helped them. Taught them that there's another kind of prey in the woods. Not deer, or rabbits, but soft, careless creatures with cabins and cars and a pitiful belief in their own safety. The ones too blind to see the predators at the edge of the campfire light. That blizzard night, facing the family, I should have ended it. Put them down before they became the unstoppable hunters they are now. But I hesitated, fooled by a flicker of something resembling mercy in their eyes. Turns out, monsters can be tactical too. They used my weakness against me, and now they have a taste for our kind. Sometimes, alone in my empty apartment, I think I can still hear the cubs yelp, echoing down through the years. It's growing up out there, see? Bigger, stronger, with a pack of its own now, maybe.
learning its parents' tactics, inheriting their cunning, and their hatred. We like to think we're the apex predator, the dominant species. That hubris will be our downfall. Because every time a hiker vanishes without a trace, every time there's a brutal, unexplained death in the deep woods, I know the truth. We're not alone in the wilds anymore. The food chain has lengthened, the old rules don't apply. And, driven by a vendetta born in the frozen heart of that mountain winter, the new predators are circling closer. This happened to me on July 22, 1994, up in Washington State, Olympic Peninsula. Lived in a small town then, worked as a park ranger. I'm Jonah. Always liked getting away from crowds, being out in the woods. Guess that makes me a predictable target for whatever lurks in the shadows. Been a hot summer. A lot of folks head up to the park for camping trips, hiking, the usual. We get calls sometimes, lost dog, twisted ankle, that kind of stuff. This day, a panicked report came in, two hikers gone missing near a remote lake. Headed out solo. No one waits for backup in situations like that. Found their abandoned campsite easily enough. Gear scattered, some stuff torn. Bear attack crossed my mind at first. They can smell food from miles around, and if surprised, things can escalate fast. But something felt wrong. No drag marks, too much mess. Whatever happened here wasn't about hunger, it was about chaos, almost. Started tracking. The forest floor was dry, making it tough, but I'm good at my job. Found a single footprint, odd, way too big to be human. More torn fabric, snagged down a branch with a few strands of coarse dark hair stuck to it. And always, that faint rotten smell hanging in the air, making the back of my throat burn. Followed the faint trail deeper into the woods. Sweat dripped into my eyes, making them sting. Flies buzzed relentlessly. It was late afternoon, but the light filtering through the canopy felt sickly, the air heavy and expectant. I started hearing noises up ahead. Grunts, low and guttural, snapping branches, a sound like something heavy being dragged. Then I saw it. Not through the trees, but in a clearing just up ahead. It was hunched over something in the center, its back to me. Massive, covered in matted fur, claws glinting in the dim light as it tore it, at what was left of one of the missing hikers. Nausea hit me like a physical blow. I dropped behind a moss-covered boulder, rifle clutched in sweaty hands. My heart pounded in my ears, a roaring that almost covered the slurping, tearing sounds coming from the clearing. Had to think. Radio for backup meant hours before help would arrive, by then. Thing was maybe fifty feet away. Too far for a clean shot through all the brush, and with the fading light. I cursed myself for underestimating this call for not bringing the heavy caliber rifle. Then it turned its head. Just slightly enough for me to see its profile and the flash of its yellow eyes. A jolt of true fear ran through me. That face, it was like a wolf, but pulled and stretched wrong. The muzzle too long, the teeth, no bear had teeth like that. Couldn't stay hidden. Whatever this thing was, it would smell me soon. Had to gamble, had to take the shot. Eased myself up behind the boulder, took aim, and squeezed the trigger. The roar of the rifle was deafening in the sudden stillness. The creature reared up, let out a howl that chilled me to the bone. 
It looked directly at me, those hate-filled eyes locking with mine. Then, it was gone, bounding away through the trees with impossible speed. There was a crash of undergrowth, and then silence. Hands shaking, I approached the clearing, dreading what I'd find, wishing I had waited. The remaining hiker was, no point in describing it. Let's just say I won't be needing dinner tonight. I tagged what was left for recovery, left my mark on a nearby tree as per procedure, and stumbled back to my truck. Radioed for assistance, my voice barely above a whisper. Didn't sleep for nights afterwards. Knew I should write a report, explain the situation, warn others. But who would believe it? They call me crazy, maybe pull my badge. This wasn't a bear, wasn't any kind of predator I understood. This was something dark and hungry, something that shouldn't exist. The report went down as animal attack, two fatalities. Every so often I see stories in the local papers about other disappearances in the park. Hikers vanished without a TR. I quit my job shortly after that. No way I was going back in those woods. Folks in town started giving me strange looks. Small towns, news travels fast, and the whispers are always just loud enough for you to hear. They thought the stress had gotten to me, that I'd snapped under the pressure. For a while, I drifted. Odd jobs. Slept in cheap motels or my truck, jumping at every shadow. Became good at disappearing, at pretending nothing was wrong. But you can't outrun your own demons. Especially not one like this. Years passed. Tried settling down once or twice, but it never worked. The nightmares wouldn't quit, the constant feeling of being watched. It shredded my nerves. Relationships crumbled. Who wants to be tied to someone as damaged as me? Eventually wound up in Montana, working on a ranch out in the middle of nowhere. Figured maybe the wide open spaces would give me some peace. I was wrong. One night, after a long day in the saddle, I was sitting on the porch with a beer trying to ignore the prickle of unease down my spine. The dog started barking at something near the edge of the fields, hackles raised. Got up, that old sense of dread creeping back. It was stupid, but I swear I could smell that same sulfurous rot from all those years back. Heard a low growl, and then one of the dogs yelped, then silence grabbed my rifle and headed towards the tree lean, flashlight beam cutting through the darkness. I found the dog. Or what was left of it. The scene was chillingly familiar, torn apart savagely, that same chaotic violence. In that moment, the last shred of denial vanished. I knew, with absolute certainty, that it had found me. The next few days are a blur. The ranch owner was convinced it was a mountain lion. Maybe some rogue animal that wandered down from Canada. I didn't argue. Just packed my meager belongings and got the hell out of there. Couldn't risk getting anyone else involved in this. Never stopped running after that. Slept with a loaded shotgun under the bed and jumped a mile if a twig snapped behind me. The nightmares only got worse. I'd wake up screaming, seeing the mangled bodies of the hikers, of the dog, and always those burning yellow eyes filled with inhuman hatred. Sometimes I'd see it out of the corner of my eye. A hulking shadow at the edge of the highway late at night a flicker of movement in an alleyway. Never long enough to be sure, but enough to keep me living on the edge of my own sanity. Drank too much, picked bad fights with strangers, 
did everything in my power to make it stop caring whether I lived or died. It's been a few years since I last spotted it, maybe it's given up, maybe moved on the easier prey. Or maybe, it's gotten smarter. Patient. Learned how to wait in the shadows until I make a fatal mistake, until I get careless, and my guard slips. I've become obsessed with survival guides, with prepping for something. Stockpiling supplies, learning new skills. Moved into a rundown cabin off an old logging road, miles from civilization. Reinforced the doors, the windows. Laid traps around the perimeter. At night, I sit in the dark, every sense strained finger curled around the rifle trigger. Some nights, I hear rustling out there in the woods. Sometimes, very late, I catch a whiff of that rotten, bloody smell. They call people like me paranoid. Unhinged. But I'll tell you this, there are things that exist in the shadows of this world, in the places where the trees grow old and the land feels forgotten. Things that defy all logic, that hunger for something more than mere flesh. They were many faces, the hulking beast in the forest, the grinning figure glimpsed in your mirror in the dead of night. And they hunt us. Out in the darkness, the wind picks up, whistling through the pines. I swear I hear a howl rise over the night sounds, distant but chillingly clear. A promise whispered on the breeze. My name is Jonah. And if you're reading this, it means I was wrong. It means the hunt isn't over. For me, maybe. But out there, for someone else? The hunt is always on. And the worst part, the thing that gnaws at your gut in those quiet moments of brutal honesty? Somewhere. Deep down, part of you knows, you could be next. This happened to me on October 23, 1991, up by the Canadian border, in the North Cascades. Old growth forests there, places where the sun barely cuts through the leaves. Name's Ethan. Lived in a cabin, off-grid back then. Like the solitude after, well, it doesn't matter now. I noticed things were off kilter one morning while getting firewood. A heavy silence hung in the air, no birds, no insects, like the whole forest was holding its breath. Found tracks then, not deer or bear, but big and clawed. That night, I heard rustling, heavy breathing, from just beyond my circle of firelight. Next day, I was out hunting. Found a deer carcass, half-eaten, torn open in a frenzy. No predator leaves a meal like that. Got an uneasy feeling, like I was being watched. Chalked it up to nerves. Bad call. On the way back, it picked up my scent. I heard it before I saw it, a low growl that made the hair on my neck stand up, footsteps thudding on the forest floor. Broke into a run. Caught glimpses of movement through the trees, a flash of yellow eyes, and then it erupted from the undergrowth, a hulking beast lunged straight for me. I barely had time to raise my rifle, fire, before it slammed into me. We tumbled down a slope. The impact knocked the breath out of me, the gun flying from my grasp. Dazed, I looked up and saw it looming over me. Everything about it was wrong. Lean, but immensely powerful, covered in coarse dark fur. The head, that was straight out of nightmares. Wolf-shaped, but stretched and distorted, its fangs the length of my hand. But worst of all were the eyes, burning with predatory intelligence. I scrambled backward, 
hands searching desperately at my belt for the hunting knife. The creature lowered its head, sniffing the air, hot breath washing over me in a stink like a rotting carcass. It opened its mouth, impossibly wide, and let out a guttural roar. In that moment, time seemed to slow down. I knew this was it, that I'd end up like that half-eaten deer. But a stubborn, desperate part of me refused to just give up. I lunged for the knife just as the creature pounced. The blade caught it across the ribs, making it stagger. I tasted blood in my mouth, a mix of mine and the creature's from where it had pinned me down. Then, a noise shattered the deadly stillness. A distant gunshot, echoing through the trees. The creature hesitated, its yellow eyes flickering with something akin to uncertainty. Then, with a last frustrated snarl, it turned and vanished into the green gloom as quickly as it had appeared. I lay there on the cold forest floor, panting. My chest ached where its weight had landed, and I could already feel the bruises forming. I stumbled to my feet, half expecting to find the beast waiting in the shadows, that the gunshot had merely startled it for a moment. But it was gone. Shaking, I located my rifle and headed back to the cabin, not daring to look over my shoulder. Each snap of a twig made me jump, every rustle sounded like it was circling back. The whole forest felt tainted, charged with an unseen menace. I packed what I could that night. Drove out before sunrise, never looked back. Told myself it was an animal attack, maybe a rabid wolf or something. But deep down, I know differently. Now, living in the city, surrounded by people, I should feel safe. But I can't shake the memory of that feeling of being hunted, the weight of its gaze on my back. Late at night, I sometimes dream of the North Cascades, the towering trees, the half-eaten carcass, and always, the gleam of those monstrous yellow eyes. The city didn't offer the sanctuary I'd craved. Every crowded street, every darkened alleyway, became a potential hunting ground. I jumped at shadows, swore I saw those burning eyes reflected in passing car windows. Tried to tell myself I was going crazy, but the nightmares wouldn't quit. Years went by. Worked a blue-collar job, kept my head down, drifted through life like a ghost. Couldn't form proper relationships. Who'd want someone as messed up as me? I hit the bottle hard, trying to drown out the memories. Didn't work too well just added another layer of misery to the whole mess. Then, one rainy night, the news was full of something happening back up north. Hiker gone missing in the Cascades, right in the same area where I'd had my encounter. They found his campsite shredded, remnants of a violent struggle. The newscast cut away, but I didn't need them to tell me the rest. That familiar prickling dread ran down my spine. I knew, with absolute certainty, that it had found its way back, had never forgotten its unfinished business with me. Next few weeks were a blur of cheap whiskey and sleepless nights. Then, a name caught my eye in the paper, Bryn Donovan. A wildlife conservationist, outspoken advocate for protecting predator habitats and leading an expedition into, precisely the patch of forest where my nightmares dwelled. A desperate plan formed in my booze-addled mind. She was my best chance. If I could find her, warn her, it would still be a suicide mission, but at least she wouldn't be walking in blind. And, even if she didn't believe me, maybe, just maybe, Having a group of people armed with high-powered rifles could stand a chance against that thing, whatever it was. Stole a buddy's old truck. 
found out where the expedition was staging, drove through the night, fueled by adrenaline and desperation. Managed to find their site just as they were loading up to head into the backcountry. Bryn Donovan was everything a nature documentary host should be, young, earnest, with a kind face and a disarming smile. I plowed through the undergrowth, heart pounding. Please, I gasped as I reached the clearing, you can't go in there. She frowned, a flicker of concern in her eyes. Sir, is everything all right? Are you lost? I took a shaky breath. Listen, there's something out there. Not an animal, not something you'll find in any textbook. You go in, and... A grizzled older guy shouldered past her. Look, buddy, we're on a schedule. This area isn't closed off, and we've got all the necessary permits. He eyed my disheveled state with open disgust. You won't understand, I pleaded, none of you will, not until. Listen, crazy guy. Bryn said, but there was an edge in her voice now. If you don't leave right now, I'm calling the park rangers. I stared at them, the well-equipped expedition team, the glint of scientific curiosity in their eyes. I was no scientist. I couldn't quantify the threat, couldn't provide a Latin name for the monster I'd encountered. How could I possibly convince them? Defeat settled over me like a shroud. I turned, walked back to the truck, feeling their stares bore into me like accusations. Drove away as fast as the old engine would allow, the image of Bryn Donovan, brave and idealistic, seared into my brain. It didn't take long. A few days later, the headlines screamed conservationists vanish in remote wilderness. The official story was a mudslide, some freak weather phenomenon, bullshit designed to pacify the public. I sit here in my rundown apartment, the bottle my only companion. Some nights, I think I hear a claw scrape across the windowpane. Sometimes I smell that rotten stench, like the grave itself, drifting up from the alley below. Every time the phone rings, my heart stutters in my chest. I know it's only a matter of time. The expedition wasn't the end. It was a sacrifice, a taste of blood that drew the predator back out of the shadows, with its appetite for the hunt. And sooner or later, It'll pick up my scent again. The final confrontation is coming, the ending I've seen in my nightmares countless times. The difference now? I'm not running anymore. I'm tired of running. I've got my grandfather's old shotgun, a box of shells, and a burning hatred in my gut strong enough to outshine the fear. Let it come. Let it find me in this dim, dirty room that echoes with whispers of my failures. Unlike all the others, unlike her, at least I'll know what's waiting in the dark. And this time, I won't go down without a fight. This happened to me on October 6, 2002. Maine remote cabin up north, only a few miles from the Canadian border. I'd hold up there to write a book, figured solitude and fresh air would get those creative juices flowing. Name's Garrett. Guess that plan didn't quite work out. First month or so was fine. Hiked, chopped firewood, rode a bit. The woods up there are dense, the kind that make you feel small remind you of just how much wildness still exists. Then, the weirdness started. Little stuff at first. A sense of being watched, rustling in the undergrowth when nothing was there. One evening, I swore I saw a flicker of something massive moving between the trees. 
figured it was a moose, just my eyes playing tricks. Should have left then. Instead, I stayed, got my rifle out of storage, and started feeling more like a hunter than a rider. Big mistake. Turns out, something had been hunting me. Found out the hard way. One afternoon, I was tracking a deer, fresh hoof prints in the mud near the creek. It had been raining, so the woods were silent, every snap twig sounding like a gunshot. Heard a snort behind me, whipped around, nothing. Took a couple steps further, then the world exploded. It hit me from the side, a blur of claws and matted fur. Knocked me off my feet, pain burning through my shoulder. I scrambled back, trying to bring the rifle up, and finally got a clear look at it. Bear, right? Had to be. Only, no. Too big, the shape was all wrong. It reared up, taller than me even on its hind legs. Fur like dirty, tangled rope, and the head, wrong. Like a wolf, stretched and warped into this monstrous, impossible shape. Its eyes, they were the worst. Yellow and filled with a terrible, hungry intelligence. I fired a blind shot, more out of panic than anything, and the recoil nearly tore my arm off. It roared, a sound that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Wounded, maybe. Lunged, and I rolled aside just in time, its claws ripping through my backpack. Got to my feet and ran, stumbling through the trees. Heard it crashing after me, its snarls echoing through the woods. Figured if I could make it to the creek, double back, maybe I could lose it, by myself some time. Up ahead, I saw a break in the trees, the gleam of water. Pushed harder, heart pounding in my ears. Burst through the last line of trees. And ran smack into another one. It was waiting, crouched in the shallows of the creek. Bigger even than the first, for glistening with water, its eyes blazing. Beside it lay the mangled corpse of a deer. They'd been sharing a meal. And now I seemed to be the next course. My breath caught in my throat. Escape cut off, two monstrous creatures between me and the cabin. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. They weren't just hungry predators, this was something more. Calculated. Intelligent. And they seemed in no hurry. The larger creature straightened and its gaze swept over me, not the look of an animal sizing up a meal, but something much colder, more critical. It took a deliberate step forward, and then a low growl rumbled from its throat. Not a warning, not a threat. A command. The other one, the one that had attacked me, snarled, the sound laced with a strange, whining note. It bared its fangs, but then, reluctantly, stepped back. The leader, it seemed. Maintaining dominance, even over a kill. There was a chilling logic at work here that made my skin crawl. Then the larger one did something that sent icy dread through me. It sat back on its haunches, forelimbs resting lightly on the ground. The twisted muzzle tilted, and those predatory eyes locked onto mine. It wasn't going to charge, it was going to wait. Wait for what? For me to collapse from exhaustion? For reinforcements to arrive? The uncertainty gnawed at me more than the immediate threat of being ripped to shreds. Time twisted and warped. Lost track of how long I stood there frozen in place, the rifle trembling in my hands. The thing in the creek watched, occasionally licking at the blood on its fur. Every rustle of leaves made me jump, the
the setting sun casting long, monstrous shadows through the trees. Finally, it moved. Stood upright, and turned its back on me. Dismissive. Like I was already dead, and simply not worth the effort. But still, it didn't leave. Just paced the creek bank, back and forth, a dark sentinel. Despair washed over me. Even with the rifle, I was outmatched. Outnumbered. If I made a break for it, they'd run me down in seconds. If I stayed put, well, dying of thirst seemed even worse than ending up as a bloody feast for these things. Panic edged close, threatening to bubble over. My breaths came in ragged gasps. The rifle, suddenly, felt like a dead weight in my hands. Then, an idea hit me, a desperate gamble born of sheer terror. I dropped the rifle. No sudden movements, just lowered it carefully to the ground. The creature in the creek paused, its gaze flickering back to me. Cautiously, I unshouldered my backpack, letting it drop as well. It watched, then resumed its pacing at the creek's edge. A test? A sign of submission? Had no way of knowing what went on in that monstrous head. Step by painstaking step, I backed away. Never broke eye contact. Finally, I was back within the treeline, the shadows swallowing me up. It still hadn't moved. I turned and fled. No looking back, just ran blindly, lungs burning, branches whipping at my face. Stumbled. Fell. Scrambled up. Kept running. Tripped over a root, tumbled. Head first down a slope. By sheer luck, I landed in a shallow ravine, choked with brambles. Lay there gasping in the wet leaves, expecting to hear the pounding of paws closing in for the final attack. But, there was only silence. An oppressive quiet broken only by my own harsh breathing and the echo of my heartbeat thudding in my ears. Hours later, when I finally had the nerve to crawl out of the ravine, night had fallen. I made it back to the cabin under the cover of darkness barricaded myself in. Didn't sleep a wink. Couldn't shake the feeling that those yellow eyes were still watching from the darkness. Next morning, I packed my things and drove away as fast as I could. Never went back. Never even looked over my shoulder. The whole thing got written off as a bear attack. Lucky to survive, folks said. They had no clue, Lucky doesn't even begin to cover it. Sometimes, I wish it had been a bear. Simple. Brutal. Nature running its course. Instead, I'm left with this unshakable knowledge that there are things in the wild that defy understanding. Creatures driven by an intelligence both cruel and cunning and with appetites that go far beyond simple hunger. Every creak of the floorboards in this city apartment reminds me of the stillness of those woods. Every rustle of wine through the trees outside the window sends a chill down my spine. Because in the back of my mind, I know those two weren't the only ones. Out there, in the vast untamed places, others lurk, waiting for some unwary soul to trespass on their domain. They learned that day, learned I wasn't a creature of the deep woods, that soft urban prey can sometimes escape their grasp. That means they also learned something else, how to follow, how to adapt, how to evolve their hunting strategy. Maybe one day I'll see a flicker of movement in a dark alley, smell that rotten stink on a crowded subway, or find monstrous clawed footprints outside my apartment door. And when that day comes, it won't be in the wilds of Maine. 
It'll be here, amidst the concrete and the crowds, where people think they're safe. And the worst part, the thing that twists a knife in my gut, is that this time, no one will believe my story. This happened to me on February 18, 1999, up in the Olympic Mountains, Washington State. Got a job as a fire lookout, little cabin high on a ridge, supposed to keep an eye out for wildfires. Figured it'd be perfect for a guy like me, loner type, loved the outdoors, needed solitude after, well, doesn't matter now. My name's Jonah. First couple of months went smooth. Hiked, chopped wood, radioed in weather reports. But then things started getting odd. That feeling, you know, like you're being watched, even when there's no one around. And not just in the woods, inside the cabin itself. Little things went missing, or were moved out of place. Figure I was just misremembering that the isolation was getting to me. But one night I woke up to a thud, and the heavy smell of wet fur hanging in the air. My flashlight beam bounced around the cramped room, then caught on something. Just for a split second, two gleaming yellow eyes staring in through the window. Next morning, I went looking for tracks didn't find much, ground was too hard up there mostly. But what I did find, huge claw marks gouged into the wooden doorframe, way higher than any bear could reach. Whatever it was, it had been big, and it wanted inside. Started barricading the cabin at night. Still didn't sleep much. That constant gnawing fear, knowing something was out there in the dark. And it was getting closer. One night, I heard snuffling right outside the door, and a heavy body slamming into the wall. Thing was testing the defenses, trying to find a way in. Then, a few days later, coming back from a supply run into town, I found Ed. Or what was left of him. Ed was an old-timer, a trapper, lived a few ridges over. His cabin was a gutted wreck and there was blood everywhere. Claw marks raked across the walls. Ed's body? Never found it. Just a ripped up backpack and some bloody scraps of clothing snagged on a tree. Radioed in for help, but didn't say much about what I'd seen. Figured they'd lock me up in the psych ward, not go hunting some monster. That night, I knew it would be coming for me. Loaded up the old shotgun Ed had given me, waited. Sure enough, just before dawn, the snuffling started outside the door. Then, a thud, and a long scraping sound, like claws against the roof. It was circling me, cutting off escape routes. The cabin creaked under its weight. A low, rumbling growl sent chills down my spine. Ed never stood a chance, and neither would I. Then, I heard something new. A whimpering sound, almost like a child crying. Stepped closer to the window, shotgun raised. There, in the pre-dawn gloom, I finally saw the beast in full. Taller than a man, covered in dark, coarse fur that seemed to ripple in the shadows. The head, that's what nightmares are made of. Like a wolf, but pulled and stretched wrong. The eyes burn like embers, and clutched against its massive chest in those clawed hands, a squirming, mewling infant. Smaller, with lighter fur, but the same monstrous head shape. And those eyes, the thing looked up at me, and what I saw in its gaze wasn't just hunger. There was intelligence, strategy, and something that twisted my stomach, a chilling protectiveness. It tilted its head, let out what could almost have been a sigh. 
Bennett turned and vanished into the trees, its offspring nestled close, its cries fading into the distance. Numb with shock, I stood staring out into the emptying woods. Not a predator protecting its territory, not an animal gone rogue. This was something more, calculated, cunning, and with a bond neither nature nor instinct could explain. There weren't just two out there, there was a family. When the rangers finally arrived, I kept my mouth shut about what I'd really seen. Passed it off as a bear attack, easier for them to swallow than the monstrous truth. They found me sitting on the cabin porch, shotgun still clutched in my hands. Took me back to civilization, offered counseling, the whole nine yards. Everyone kept telling me to move on, put it behind me. But how could I? Out there, in the wild places, that family was still lurking. Ed's death would just have made them smarter, more cautious. Now, they had a score to settle. Weeks later, I broke. Left my apartment, sold my stuff, and disappeared off the grid. Figured if they couldn't find me, couldn't track me, maybe I'd finally be safe. Bought a run-down old RV, hit the road. Tried to keep moving, never staying in one place too long. It worked for a while. The constant change of scenery kept the nightmares at bay, almost made me believe I'd outrun my demons. Then, one rainy night parked outside some small-town diner in Nevada, I made a mistake. Got complacent. Figured, who'd be out looking in the middle of nowhere? Left the windows cracked for ventilation. Woke up to a scream. Ripped out of a nightmare, and right back into one. My dog, Blue, he'd been sleeping by the door. Now there was a sickening smear across the floorboards, his collar lying in a puddle of blood. The driver's side window was shattered inward. I staggered back, hand fumbling for the pistol I now kept hidden under the mattress. That's when I saw them, scratched into the rain-streaked metal beneath the broken glass, those monstrous claw marks. Stumbled out of the RV, pistol clutched in my shaking hands, scanning the empty desert. No sign of them, just the fading echo of Blue's cries and the splatter of blood that marked the spot where they'd snatched him. That's when I stopped running. No point. They knew my scent, had tasted my fear. Wherever I went, they'd find me. My only chance now, was to find them. Sold the RV, bought a beat-up old truck, loaded it with supplies. Started scouring those backcountry roads, those forgotten places where the maps go blank. Hunted rumors, old wives' tales, any whisper about strange sightings or unexplained disappearances. Took logging jobs, ranger gigs, anything that got me deep into the wilderness for stretches at a time. It's been years now. A blur of sleepless nights, dead-end trails, and sightings that always lead nowhere. The grief over blue has hardened into a cold burning rage that keeps me going. Sometimes, I worry I'm becoming just like those creatures, obsessed, fueled by hate, a shadow haunting the shadows. Found another dog. A stray mott, tough as nails. Named him Rusty, and we're inseparable. He knows something's hunting us. Every night, curled up by my feet, his ears twitch, his eyes fix on the darkness, seeing the things I pray he never has to face. The local folks in these mountain towns, they think I'm crazy. Maybe they're right. Maybe I died up on that mountain the day I saw those glowing eyes, and this is all some kind of twisted purgatory. But I swear, one of these days, I'm going to find them. I'll track them to their lair. 
That cabin on the ridge was my home. They invaded it, killed my friend, shattered my peace. Now, it's their turn to know what it's like to be prey. If I'm lucky, I'll bring them down myself, end their reign of terror. Or, if I die trying, well, at least then this bloody hunt will finally be over. Out there, somewhere under the vast, uncaring sky, they're waiting. They've grown stronger, smarter. Probably have more of those monstrous offspring by now. It doesn't matter. I'm coming for them, packing enough firepower to raise hell, and I'll either walk out of those woods with my vengeance, or I won't walk out at all. Some nights, lying awake in the truck, I hear a faint whimpering on the wind. I tell myself it's just coyotes, or a wounded animal. Deep down, though, I know the truth. Somewhere in the darkness, born on the echoes of my own grief, come the mewling cries of monsters, hungry for another taste of my fear. This happened to me on July 25, 1995, up in Alaska. Been working as a fishing guide up there, living in a small town on the coast. Figured I'd earn enough in the summer, spend the winters in a cabin way out in the bush. Solitude, time to think, that's why I craved after leaving the Marines. My name's Wyatt. Those Alaskan woods are something else. Vast, teeming with life, but they hold a silence like nowhere else on earth. Hunted a lot that first season in my spare time, deer, elk, just to fill the freezer. And as I went deeper into the wilderness, I got the feeling, like I wasn't alone. Eyes watching me from the trees, heavy footsteps that stopped when I did, just out of sight. Figured my nerves were getting the better of me. Told myself it was a bear, at most. Then, heading home one evening, I found it. A moose carcass. But this wasn't a clean kill. The body was ravaged, torn with a fury no predator I knew possessed. Blood and fur were scattered everywhere, and in the trampled mud were tracks larger than my damn hand. My blood ran cold. Whatever did that was still nearby. I backed slowly away, rifle at the ready, eyes scanning the tree lean. And that's when I heard it, a low, guttural growl that went right through me. Snapped my head around, nothing. Just the trees, and the deepening twilight. Didn't get much sleep that night, shotgun loaded, a fire burning just to keep the shadows at bay. Morning came, I grabbed my gear and hiked back to the kill site. Thing was gone, carcass vanished leaving only those monstrous tracks snaking off into the woods. Tried to tell myself it was a one-off, a weird encounter. But the next few trips, it was the same. Half-eaten carcasses, those chilling sounds echoing through the trees, and always that feeling of being stalked. One rainy afternoon, it finally decided to show itself. Heard a noise behind my cabin the door slightly ajar. Eased outside, rifle raised, ready for anything. Movement flickered at the edge of the woods, and I caught a glimpse of towering darkness between the trees, a gleam of yellow eyes, then it was gone. That's when I met Eli, an old native Alaskan from the village. He listened to my story, then nodded grimly. Told me tales, legends about a creature they called Adlet. A monstrous beast, a thing of blood and shadows and endless hunger. Armed with Eli's knowledge and a shotgun loaded with silver-tipped buckshot, hell, worth a try, I went hunting for the thing. Found it crouched over the remnants of a deer, it's back to me. Leveled the shotgun and squeezed the trigger. 
the blast echoed through the trees, made it whip its head around. Buckshot peppered its fur, drawing blood. A roar split the air, a sound of pain and even greater fury. It charged, moving inhumanly fast despite its size. I fired again and again, the recoil slamming into my shoulder. The buckshot tore into its flesh, leaving smoking wounds, but it kept coming. I barely had time to rack another shell into the chamber before it was on me. The impact was like getting hit by a freight train. The shotgun flew from my hands, and I went down hard, the breath knocked out of me. Through a haze of pain, I saw the creature loom over me. It was even more grotesque up close. Massive, yes, but it seemed, warped. The limbs too long, the muscles rippling impossibly beneath its matted fur. In the head, the wolf-like features were stretched, pulled into a nightmarish mask. Rows of dagger-sharp teeth rimmed a dripping maw. Those eyes blazed with malevolent intelligence. It snarled, hot spittle showering my face. Reared up, claws poised to shred me to ribbons. I squeezed my eyes shut, waiting for the killing blow. Then a new sound echoed through the forest, a howl, long and mournful, filled with primal rage. The creature froze, then whirled away from me. Blinking in shock, I saw Eli burst from the tree lean, an ancient rifle in his hands. He leveled it, and fired again, the blast booming. The creature staggered, a ragged hole now visible in its shoulder. Then, it turned and ran, disappearing into the trees with shocking speed. My heart pounded in my chest like a war drum. I dragged myself to my feet, legs wobbling. You alive? Eli rasped, striding toward me through the damp undergrowth. Think so, I choked out, clutching at the aching ribs. Thanks to you. He grunted, then gestured at the place where the creature had vanished. Adlet. The stories, they're true. A strange flicker of fear sparked in his eyes. Now it knows you. It won't forget. Eli was right. It didn't forget, and it didn't give up. The rest of that summer was hell, smashed windows at the cabin, livestock mutilated in the night, the constant feeling of being watched, hunted. Finally, it escalated. Returning from the village once, I found the cabin burnt to cinders, everything I owned gone. And next to the ruins, a message scrawled in charcoal, Eli's severed hand, impaled on a spike. That's when I knew I couldn't run anymore. Weeks later, we corner the beast. A full moon night, snow thick on the ground making it easy to follow its tracks Eli, me, and two guys from town, all armed to the teeth. We tracked it to an old, abandoned mine deep in the hills. It was waiting inside. The fight, you can't even call it that. A slaughterhouse. The first guy, barely got his rifle up before it was on him, tearing him apart. Then Eli, firing until the last, before a clawed hand ripped out his throat. I emptied my shotgun, the blasts echoing in the tunnels hit it, sure, but it seemed barely slowed. It stalked toward me, blood dripping from its jaws, those yellow eyes gleaming with a terrible triumph. Just as it lunged, I triggered the blasting caps I'd wired earlier. The mine shook with the explosion, collapsing inward on itself. I don't rightly know if that killed the thing, buried it for good. Didn't wait around to find out. Sometimes, late at night, I can still feel its eyes on me in the darkness. They don't even find a body torn up nearby. The news just says animal attack or lost hiker. 
people get comfortable, they think monsters only exist in stories. That may be the worst part, the part that eats away at my gut. They're oblivious, going about their lives, while out there in the shadows, things lurk. Things older than the world, driven by hungers we can barely comprehend. Eli was right. You cross paths with a creature like the Adlet, it doesn't forget, doesn't forgive. I'm living proof of that, and every day I wake up wondering if it's finally caught my scent again. The hunt is never really over, see? Not until one of us ends up a bloody pile on the forest floor. Maybe I'm paranoid. Maybe the thing's moved on, forgotten our little encounter deep in the Alaskan wilds. Maybe, and this is what keeps me up in a cold sweat, maybe it learned something. Maybe it's gotten smarter, more cunning, biding its time in the endless night. Or maybe, just maybe, it's changed tactics entirely. Maybe it's not out there in the dark woods anymore, stalking prey under the moonlight. Maybe it's figured out that the easiest way to find a lonely man isn't in the wilderness, it's in the city. This happened to me on July 3, 1991, in the Bitterroot Mountains, Montana. Back then, I lived all alone in a cabin out there. No wife, no kids, just me in the trees. Some folks would call it lonely. I called it peaceful. I spent my days hunting, fishing, tending the small garden, the usual mountain man stuff. My name's Harlan. Harlan Bishop. One evening, I was chopping firewood out back. It was a clear night, stars out in force. Funny. I remember thinking I should have been able to see more wildlife under that kind of light. There wasn't even the usual sound of crickets. Just this quiet that wrapped around me. Then, it happened. Up on the hillside, I saw a pair of eyes. They glowed like embers in the darkness. I froze. These weren't deer eyes, and I knew it. They were too high off the ground, too far apart. Whatever this thing was, it was big. I dropped my axe. Something grunted deep in the shadows. It started coming down the slope toward me. I took a step back, then another. My heart was pounding in my chest now. I looked for my rifle, it was leaning against the cabin wall, a good fifty feet away. Then, it stepped out into the moonlight. Lord have mercy, the thing was massive, standing near eight feet tall, hunched forward. It had fur, thick and dark. I saw claws, long as knives, and a muzzle that would make a wolf look like a pup. Its face, it looked almost human, but twisted. Wrong. I turned and ran. The cabin was my only shot. Every step, I expected to feel its claws ripping into my back. The door was wide open. I burst inside, slamming it shut behind me. I fumbled for the rifle, hands shaking worse by the second. Loaded it. The thing crashed against the door, the wood groaning and splintering. I raised the gun, aimed for the center mass and fired. The roar of the gunshot deafened me in the small space. Through blurred vision, I saw the thing recoil, bellow in a noise that was both animal and something far, far worse. Then, it was gone. Silence descended again, but I could still hear my heart hammering in my ears. That night, I didn't sleep. I sat with the rifle across my lap, watching the door and windows warily. I smelled the creature's stink on the doorframe. Come dawn, 
I stepped cautiously out into the open, rifle raised. I tracked it through the woods. Found blood, tufts of fur, even a broken off claw that must have been near three inches long. The tracks led deeper into the mountains, and I wasn't fool enough to follow alone. I went back to town. I told the sheriff my story. He looked at me like I was either drunk or plum crazy. I don't blame him, I sounded crazy. But I knew what I saw. Still know it, even after all these years. A couple of months later, a hunter vanished up in those mountains. Never found a trace of him. Some whispered it was me, that I'd gone and turned killer. Most folks just thought it was a bear attack. No one believed the truth. I moved away, soon after. Couldn't shake the memory, couldn't bear the feeling of those eyes watching me in the dark. But here's the thing, every so often, I hear stories. Sightings of a huge creature up the Bitterroots. Sometimes campers disappear. People talk about those stories, try to explain it away. Me, I know the truth. I don't talk about it much. Wouldn't want folks to think I'm. The cabin door creaks open and slams hard against the wall. I whirl around, leveling my gun, finger on the trigger. A chill ripples down my spine. I can smell it, that same musky, rotten stench that clings to my worst nightmares. My hands begin to shake, fear coursing through me after all these years. Something moves in the darkness outside the window, and a pair of glowing eyes stare back at me. Sweat trickles down my forehead, my hands slick on the rifle. Decades haven't dulled the memory. Haven't erased the terror that seizes my gut. It's here. It's back. Outside, the creature growls, low and guttural. Each ragged breath sounds like a promise of pain, like the rasp of a knife being sharpened. My mind races. This cabin's new, sturdier than the last. But it won't hold forever. Not against something like that. I glance at the phone, useless. Power lines are the first thing these storms take out. No help coming. Movement outside the window. A massive, clawed hand slams against the glass, cracking the pane. My heart thuds against my ribs, choking me. I know this is where those stories end the missing campers, the vanished hunters. I won't go down easy. I aim, my hand surprisingly steady as years of fear transform into cold fury. I fire through the shattered window. The creature roars, a sound slicing through the night. The smell of burnt fur and something fouler fills the air. I've hit it. But it doesn't run. Instead, it circles the cabin, methodical and relentless. My rifle clicks empty. Frantically, I reach for my hunting knife, a flimsy thing compared to the monster outside, but it's all I have left. A crash of wood, the back door. The creature tears through my home like tissue paper, splintered fragments flying. My eyes lock with those terrible glowing ones. I raise my knife in a pathetic gesture of defiance. It lunges. Darkness washes over me, followed by searing, indescribable pain. I scream, the sound swallowed by the hungry night. The news reports are terse. Reclusive man found dead in remote cabin. Suspected bear attack. Authorities find my ravaged body, evidence of a struggle. The destroyed cabin is ruled unsafe, condemned. No further investigation. 
My name becomes just another entry on the list of casualties in the vast wilderness. One deputy, young and still willing to believe, sees the scattered scraps of dark fur, the claw marks far too large for any bear. Finds the odd, almost human footprints around the wreckage. He files his report, and it's silently added to a growing stack of unsolved cases in the Bitterroots. Hikers tell tales late at night, voices hushed. Stories of a monstrous shadow lurking in the trees, of glowing eyes on the ridgeline. Warnings whispered to those who dare to venture too deep into the mountains. The legend grows with each passing year. And somewhere in that dark heart of the Bitterroot wilderness, the creature endures. It bears my scars, tastes the memory of my defiance. It is patient, cunning, fueled by an ancient, insatiable hunger. It waits. In the depths of those woods, the whispers are correct, not all monsters are myths. Some are horrifyingly real, their stories written in blood and the lingering echoes of unanswered screams. This happened to me on February 27, 2008. Out in Montana, near the Idaho border. Name's Wade. Ran a trap line up there. Lived in a cabin built by my granddad solid but old, tucked away in a stand of pine trees. Didn't see many folks, but that's the way I liked it. Always reckoned those woods were old, something primal and untouched about them. But most days, the only sound was the wind through the trees. Then, a few weeks back, I started finding things, messed up. Traps sprung, but nothing in them, just first snagged on the branches. Half-eaten deer carcass, but the kill wasn't clean like a mountain lion's work. And, strangest of all, I kept coming across tracks that sent shivers down my spine, too big for any critter I knew of, clawed all wrong. Started sleeping with my shotgun close at hand. Figured it was nerves playing tricks on me. Then, one night I heard it. Right outside my cabin, heavy, padding footsteps circling in the darkness, accompanied by a low snarl that sounded like it came from the depths of hell. Didn't sleep a wink. Morning came, and I ventured out, rifle ready. Found more of those monstrous tracks leading into the thickest part of the woods. My dog, Buck, a good hound whined at my feet. Stay close, boy, I muttered, the fur prickling on the back of my neck. Followed the tracks till they vanished into a rocky ravine. Took a deep breath, and headed in. Buck whined again, but he was a good dog, loyal. Figured if something were in there, he'd warn me. It was dark in the ravine, choked with trees and thick, mossy boulders. My heart hammered in my ears as we made our way deeper. Then, movement flickered across my vision, a big shape, darting between the shadows. I raised the rifle, trying to make out what the hell I was dealing with. Bark, I hissed, but there was no answering bark. I peered around a tree, the sickening smell of rot thick in the air took a step forward, and tripped over something. It was Buck. Or what was left of him. Torn apart, viscera splattered across the rocks. Nausea roiled in my gut. Crouched there for a second, fighting the urge to throw up, to run, then I heard it again, a growl, and a rustling behind me. Whirled around, rifle leveled, finger on the trigger. And there it was. Not just big, it was massive. Towering on hind legs like a bear, but leaner, its fur like oily shadows clinging to its frame. The head, that's where your mind broke down. 
wolf-like, but monstrously distorted, the muzzle inhumanly long, dripping with blood. And the eyes, yellow, blazing with hungry light. I fired. The roar of the shotgun filled the ravine. The thing staggered, let out a howl that split the air. Buck's blood spattered its chest. Rage twisted those monstrous features. It lunged. I scrambled backwards, fumbling for another shell. The creature landed with a force that shook the ground. I snapped the rifle up, fired again point blank. The blast sent it reeling backwards. I took my chance, turned tail and ran, stumbling over roots and rocks. Heard the enraged creature giving chase, its snarl echoing against the ravine walls. Tripped, sprawling headlong. Scrabbled back up, rifle forgotten. The thing was gaining ground, its breath rasping in horrifying chorus with my own. I could smell its foul stench, feel the heat of its rage wash over me like a wave. Up ahead, a flicker of light. The mouth of the ravine. Lungs burning, legs like jelly, I lunged forward, toward safety, toward sunlight. And slammed headfirst into something solid and unyielding. Not a rock. Fur. My scream got cut short as a giant clawed hand clamped down over my mouth and dragged me backward. I thrashed, clawed at that monstrous arm, but its grip was iron. Pain exploded in my shoulder as I was yanked bodily into the shadows. The creature held me in its monstrous grip, its rancid breath making me gag. Up close, it was even more horrifying. The fangs, glistening in the dim light, each longer than my hand. Those eyes, they held a terrible intelligence, a cruel curiosity, like a cat contemplating a wounded mouse. It tilted its head, then opened its mouth impossibly wide. A scream tore itself loose from my throat as its teeth descended. It took two days for the search party to find what was left of me. Folks figured it was a bear, maybe a rogue grizzly that had wandered down from further north. They were wrong. The claw marks on the few ragged scraps of my clothes weren't made by any bear. No one ever found the cabin. Figure that thing took up residence there. Reckon it's probably still lurking in those woods, hunting anything foolish or unlucky enough to cross its path. The news reports called me a missing hiker, victim of a tragic accident. It makes for a good story, I guess, a clean one, easy to swallow. They spin tales like that to make themselves feel safe, to pretend that there aren't still dark corners of this world where the maps end and the shadows writhe with things best left unseen. Sometimes, I swear I can still hear that snarl in the stillness of the night. See those yellow eyes reflecting in the darkness of my room. And deep down, part of me knows it's just a question of time until they finally come for me. That even here, hundreds of miles away surrounded by concrete and cars, I'm still being stalked. The hunt never truly ended. You see, I didn't just survive a monster that day in the ravine, I tasted its blood. It tasted mine. That creates a bond, a connection forged in the heart of primal darkness. Out there, somewhere in those wild Montana woods, the creature remembers. It knows my scent. It bides its time, driven by a hunger that can never be sated. Some days, staring out at the sprawling city, I get to wondering. Maybe it isn't tracking me anymore. Maybe it doesn't need to. Maybe that day, something inside me changed, twisted to mirror the darkness in its own heart. Maybe the old Wade, the one who loved the peace of the woods, 
died back there in the ravine. Maybe the thing that crawled out, wearing his skin, is far more suited to this urban jungle than he ever was. Maybe those whispers I hear late at night aren't the wind, but my own inner voice, rasping with an unfamiliar hunger. Maybe the shadows I see moving at the edge of my vision aren't just tricks of the light. Maybe the predator isn't out there, lurking in the wild places. Maybe it's here, walking unnoticed among the unsuspecting crowds. Maybe it's closer than you think. Maybe, just maybe, it's reading this right now.